I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. Chilling video. A single mom desperately runs for her life trying to escape a rapist. He told me to get undressed and I was crying, shaking up control of the Kidnapped at gunpoint, beaten and forced to pose for naked photos. It's 72 minutes of terror. You feel that her attacker planned to kill her. But when she gets away, the monster makes one big mistake that leads to his capture and nobody's prepared for who he is. Are you in disbelief? Absolutely. Today, his bizarre police interrogation, where the key clue is hard to dispute. So you have trouble getting Yes. Then an honor student graduates from high school, only to be murdered in the most vicious of ways. Who would do something like this? Dead in her bed, killed by a masked intruder. But what was his motive? A crime of passion or retaliation. Crime Watch Daily special correspondent Kim Goldman investigates who is the secret mystery man she'd been meeting before her death. And it appeared that she didn't want other people to know she was meeting with this person. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. Just imagine you're walking to your car in the middle of a busy parking lot. A crazed man drives up, sticks the barrel of a gun in your face, and tells you to get in or you're dead. What would you do? It could happen to any one of us, and it actually did happen to one woman in Ontario, California. Our Narissa Knight has her incredible story of courage. Chris, it was 72 minutes a California woman will never forget. And today she's reliving those moments that began in this parking lot with her being abducted at gunpoint while leaving her job. A daring escape caught on tape. It was then or never. A single mom on the run from a rapist. I ran like the hounds of hell were, were on my heels. But her nightmare was far from over. My stomach dropped. I knew I wasn't dealing with the average person. Bringing her attacker to justice would be difficult and dangerous. I couldn't be out in public. And in a Crime Watch Daily exclusive. Are you and your wife having regular sex? No. An interrogation like no other. So you have trouble getting arrested? Yes. Springtime about seven years ago, Erin Orcutt was loving her life as a new mom. You enjoyed being a young mother. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a great privilege to be able to be a mother. When she wasn't busy with her son, she was busy working. Erin was a cocktail waitress at a restaurant in Ontario, California. At the time, I would spend my weeks with, with my son, and on the weekends, I would be at work pretty much from Thursday night to Sunday afternoon. But one Saturday in April, business was slow. Erin suddenly had an afternoon to herself when she left work early. You get off in the middle of the day, you're excited about having the rest of your evening, you're not thinking bad things are gonna happen to you. But something really bad was about to happen. When I got to my car, I had a habit of clicking my unlock button twice because it unlocks all the doors. Just as Erin opened her door, she heard... Get in the car. At first, she thought it was just a co-worker pulling a prank. When did you start realizing that this is serious? When I saw the gun. This was no joke. The stranger had a gun pointed directly at Erin. She knew hollering for help wouldn't do any good. It's very rare for the parking lot to be empty. Unfortunately for me, it, it was empty. And if someone did pass, they likely would not see the gun. He held it very low to his waist, and he had a friend behind him who was kind of blocking from the aisle direction. He had an accomplice. Erin mm -hmm. worried if she tried to make a run for it, he'd shoot. Instead, she followed his commands. I got in the car, he got in the passenger seat, and told me to drive. 
The accomplice stayed behind, and now Erin and her abductor were alone, leaving the mall parking lot on a ride to hell. He didn't tell me where to drive, and since I grew up in the area, I knew of a few places where cops tended to hang out. So I figured I would try to steer that direction. I contemplated driving my car off the road or ramming into somebody else or just putting it in park and running. Aaron was also begging the strange man to let her go. I pleaded with him, just, you know, you can take my car. I'm not worried about it. I won't call the cops. Just take my car and, and let me out. When he told her to pull over, Aaron drove into a restaurant lot where she'd always seen cops hanging out. Hopefully somebody's there and maybe that'll scare him. The fact that there's a cop right there. Unfortunately for me, there was no cop there. The gunman ordered her to drive around to the back of the building, but she couldn't. There was a storage unit attached to it. He couldn't get back there without a code. He was very upset. He kept going, drive around at the back, and I said, there is no back. Surveillance video obtained exclusively by Crime Watch Daily shows Erin and her abductor pulling into the parking lot. I'm parked facing a window into a storage facility, and there's a, you know, not a, uh, there was a gas station down the street. There's a Denny's behind me. There's a liquor store right there. I thought, there's no way. There's no way anything's going to happen. But Erin was wrong. As soon as she parked, the gunman forced her at gunpoint into the back seat. I started crying. He got in the back seat with me um, and kind of sat where my car seat was. He was sitting on top of your baby's seat. Mm-hmm. Aaron says he then ordered her to take off her clothes. She desperately pleaded with him to let her go. He made it clear that wasn't going to happen. This nightmare was far from over. He ended up putting the gun to my head and told me to stop crying. He actually um, racked the gun and a bullet popped out and landed in the seat. I knew the gun was fully loaded. You knew he meant business. Up next, a daring escape. I booked it out running, crying, and screaming. The breathless moment caught on tape, and what the rapist leaves behind leaves cops speechless. What did you think when you saw that? I was shocked. A young California mother thinks her life is about to end. She's kidnapped and forced to drive from one parking lot to another by a madman with a gun. Then she's viciously attacked for close to an hour. Our Nerissa Knight is in the very parking lot where a brave split-second decision saved her life. Chris, this is the spot where most of the terror unfolded. 72 minutes a California woman will never forget. And today she's reliving those terrifying moments with Crime Watch Daily to show other survivors they are not alone. Erin Orcutt was all smiles as she left her waitressing job one Saturday afternoon in April. I happened to get off early. We were incredibly dead. But moments later, the single mom's carefree spirit would be filled with terror. He had a gun pointed at me. He told me to get in the car. Erin was forced to drive while the strange gunman sexually assaulted her. Before long, she parked in what she thought would be a safe spot. There's a lot of foot traffic that goes on in that area. Despite the businesses all around, the dark tinted windows made it impossible for anyone to see what was now happening in the back of her SUV. He um, told me to get undressed and I was crying, shaking uncontrollably. Aaron's tears quickly dry up when her abductor sticks the gun in her mouth, aggressively demanding she shut up. What did you do then? He had me sit on top of his lap and he tried, tried to penetrate me, but he, he couldn't do it. But Aaron says that didn't matter. The abuse continued. He had me but he was taking pictures the entire time. And I looked up and he smiled and he snapped again. And then he told me to uh, smile pretty and took a picture of me without my clothes on. 
Not only was he taking pictures, the violent rapist started texting the lewd photos to the accomplice he left back at the mall parking lot. The two men were soon talking on the phone. His friend was like, where are you? He goes, oh, you don't see me, I'm right here, and was playing around. He was laughing on his phone. I couldn't believe it. The laughter didn't last. Aaron says in an instant, rage took over. He'd just stare at me, just dead eyes, and just hit me. He socked me in the face a few times. Um, he had me get on my stomach, and he tried to rape me from behind. He, he really couldn't. After about an hour, the gunman told Aaron to get dressed. Their road trip was about to take an even darker turn. He had mentioned that we were going to go to the desert and finish this. I knew it. If I didn't get out right then and there, I, there's no way I would have made it out. Though racked with fear, she discreetly noticed his gun had fallen to the floor and was now under the passenger seat. She thought about the child lock on her back door. I had child locks on the side of the car that he was on, and the side that I was on was behind the driver's side door. There was no child locks. Just then, her attacker's phone rang again, and this time when he answered, Aaron's survivor instinct kicked into full throttle. It was now or never. I threw the door open and I ran, like the hounds of hell were, were on my heels. Crime Watch Daily has obtained this exclusive surveillance video showing Aaron's desperate sprint to safety. What you can't hear were her piercing screams for help the entire time. He has a gun, he has a gun, everybody get back inside. Aaron had no idea, but the owner of the nearby liquor store had been keeping a suspicious eye on her SUV. He knew there were two people inside. He was about to call police. He grabbed me inside and he threw me behind the register. So I just at that point, I lost it. Detective Robert Marquez with the Ontario Police Department was one of the first on scene. He says if Aaron hadn't run when she did, she wouldn't be telling her story. I don't think he was going to let her go. He had done too many things in front of too many cameras, and uh, his plan was to take her somewhere and, and harm her. You feel that her attacker planned to kill her? Yes. Once Aaron made her dangerous escape, the gunman tried to make his own. He had grabbed my keys and tried to start my car, but I had a kill switch. So he couldn't have started the car unless he knew where the sensor was. When he couldn't drive away, he took off on foot, quickly getting lost in all the traffic. His getaway wouldn't last long. Erica's attacker made one critical mistake. He left his gun inside the car. And that's not all. Taped on the bottom of the magazine was his name. My stomach dropped. Up next, a shocking arrest that leaves Aaron living in fear. They did everything in their power aside from witness protection just to make sure that I was safe. And a Crime Watch Daily exclusive, the suspect's unusual interrogation. Does it cause you to have a hard time? I usually can. Erin Orcutt has just escaped the savage who kidnapped and viciously sexually assaulted her for more than an hour. It was literally a do or die moment, but now police have a suspect and Erin wonders if she's in more danger than ever before. Our nurse tonight has the rest of Erin's unbelievable story of bravery. Chris, as police work to find the men who abducted Aaron, they would be handed a giant clue left behind here by one of the suspects, a gun. And it wasn't just any gun. Kidnapped at gunpoint while leaving work, Aaron Orcutt was beaten and raped inside her SUV. The horrifying assault went on for more than an hour before she finally broke free and fled for her life. I think he was surprised that she escaped and then he went into a panic type mode. But in his own rush to get away, the attacker left behind plenty of evidence. We were able to locate his gun, her clothing, uh, biological fluids, and his sunglasses. 
And right there, taped on the bottom of the gun's magazine, was their biggest clue, the suspect's name. But strangely, it was a labeling technique Detective Robert Marquez knew very well. Normally, police officers, they will put their name on the bottom of the magazine in case they have to let somebody else use their magazine in a gunfight. What did you think when you saw that? I was shocked. And his shock was about to turn to outrage. As cops were investigating Aaron's abduction, an officer, Anthony Orban, from the nearby city of Westminster, was reporting his gun missing or stolen in the Ontario area. They kind of put two and two together and they decided, hey, this is related. But related how? Detectives knew either the sick man who kidnapped and raped Aaron had used a cop's gun, or the demented attacker was a cop himself. Officer Orban was tracked down to a nearby parking lot where he was helping a friend and fellow officer find his truck. Yes, Jeffrey Jelinek was a correctional officer for the state of California. Orban and Jelinek matched the descriptions Aaron had given of her attacker and his accomplice. They even had her keys. Aaron was soon brought over to ID them both. There was, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 cop cars with floodlights just lighting him up. I've never seen anything like that before, but they pulled right up and let me ID him, and as soon as I did, um, they took me back to the, to the hospital. How did that sit with you when you learned that your attacker was a police officer? My initial thought was, oh my gosh, nobody's ever gonna seek justice for this because he's one of them. I was very fortunate to be wrong. Officers Orban and Jelnek were immediately taken into custody. Suddenly, both claimed they couldn't remember a thing. Why is your gun in this girl's car? I don't know. Do you remember pulling down your pants? No. Why were you guys over by Dave and Buster? I don't know. Do you remember following the girl to the car? I don't. In this exclusive video obtained by Crime Watch Daily, Officer Orban claims he drank too many margaritas at lunch, causing him to black out. I haven't drank in a very, very, very long time. But what he did admit to detectives corroborated what Aaron tearfully revealed. I've been on those depress the antidepressants and it just kills your sex drive. Does it cause you to have a hard time? Um, I usually can't even... So you have trouble getting Yes. After a short time behind bars, Officer Jelnek apparently regained some of his memory. He told us at the very end of his interrogation, you might want to look at the photos. And I said, what photos? And he said, the photos on my phone. I went, what? On his phone, all the pictures Anthony Orban snapped while forcing Aaron to perform sex acts on him. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just thought this poor girl. He sent those photos to Jelinek. Why? I think they were playing some type of sick game and tried to outdo each other. Even though his friend caved, Anthony was sticking to his script. Get a chance to talk to Jeff a little bit more. He's not losing his whole career for you. What? I I don't remember anything. He didn't remember anything either, but all of a sudden now, after sitting in the system, I don't remember he... anything. Detectives say even when they weren't in the room, Officer Orban kept up the charade. This has got to be a bad dream. What is going on? What the f Because he knows the camera's there. He's an investigator himself. He's a police officer. He was assigned to sex investigations. Wait, he's a sex crimes officer? Yes. What type of irony is this? How, are you in disbelief? Absolutely. And in yet another shocking twist, the same antidepressant that Officer Orban blamed for his impotence problem, he also blamed for the assault on Aaron. He claimed that he had taken Zoloft while he was drinking alcohol. So he said the Zoloft made him do it? That's correct. Officer Orban pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming the Zoloft left him unconscious during the attack. I was pissed. 
So pissed. So many people are on Zoloft and they're not gonna go off and rape somebody and kidnap them at gunpoint. It was an excuse. It was excuse after excuse after excuse. And it was all about him being the victim. But there was an actual victim, Aaron Orcutt. Though the terror from a rape at gunpoint was over and her attacker behind bars, she was now facing a second frightening ordeal. He was making phone calls that were being recorded from the jail. Um, making statements like it would be a lot easier if the witness wasn't around and I was getting weird phone calls and I did get followed on the freeway and we didn't know if it was related or not but I was terrified. The district attorney's office was so worried about possible retaliation Aaron had to remain in seclusion during the trial. They did everything in their power aside from witness protection just to make sure that I was safe. She was only allowed to attend Orban's trial the day she testified and the day the verdicts were handed down. When they found him guilty on all counts and sane, I broke. I just, I broke down because at that point I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there's an end to this now. Jurors rejected his insanity defense, finding Anthony Orban guilty of kidnapping, rape, and multiple counts of sexual assault eight felony counts in all. His accomplice, Jeff Jelinek, had testified against him in court, agreeing to plead no contest in exchange for a lighter sentence. Jelinek was eventually sentenced to five years after he was released. He went back to live with his mom and dad back east. Two and a half years after she was kidnapped and raped, Erin was going to confront her attacker in court. On sentencing day, a brave Aaron was more than ready. I got a phone call and they told me, you may not have to even come down today. They found him dead in his cell. Anthony Orban committed suicide by hanging himself. I needed that closure and I was just in tears. I had been right there willing to forgive him. And once that happened, I was finding it very hard to cling to that forgiveness. In a highly unusual and unprecedented move, the judge still allowed Erin to read her victim impact statement while Anthony's family respectfully remained in court and listened. No amount of reasoning can justify the horrors that I was forced to endure that day and those who tried should be ashamed of themselves. I am disappointed that a person in your position would have behaved in such a way and that you tried to get away with it instead of owning up to your actions like a real man. But then a real man would never have kidnapped, raped, beaten, and terrorized a woman. I choose to live my life and take back any power that your actions may have had over me. To do so, I have to do something that I have struggled with and never thought I would be able to do. I forgive you. So in your heart, you found room to forgive him. You can't move on without doing so. Erin has moved on, but it hasn't been easy. Diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, Erin has suffered from panic attacks and depression. And yet, this strong survivor refuses to break. And it was either, okay, get back up and figure your life out, or you're gonna cling to it as a crutch and be that person that's just a victim forever, and I wasn't about to be a victim. If he had not taken his own life, Anthony Orban would have spent the rest of it behind bars. The judge in the case revealed she was planning to sentence him to 82 years to life in prison, followed by a 95-year sentence. Up next, a teen with a promising future murdered in her own bed while her family slept. I still have the blanket. I still have the pretend like I, it didn't happen. Crime Watch Daily with all new clues pointing to a mystery man in Ashley's life. They talk about people with double lives and stuff, but Ashley was like way too honest to have a double life. Coming up. Welcome back to Crime Watch Daily. A 19 year old honor student goes to bed with a bright future to dream about, only to be murdered in her sleep. Our special correspondent, Kim Goldman, investigates. Chris, Ashley Love had just graduated high school with honors when a masked gunman stormed into her family's home. All of a sudden, I just see her face was just gone. And her grieving parents will never be able to erase the nightmare seen from their minds. I still have the blanket. I still have the pretend like it didn't happen. 
Mom Tammy and Dad Joe found it difficult to talk about Ashley without breaking down when they told Crime Watch Daily's special correspondent Kim Goldman of their heartbreak. It's hard, huh? Ashley held a special place in their hearts as the only girl among their three children. What was her role in the family? She was like a little mama to her little brother, Alex. There comes Ashley now. They say she was about the nicest kid any parent could hope to have. She was a sweetheart. She really was from the day she was born. Happy birthday, Ashley. No matter what, says Joey Clancy, Ashley's best friend since kindergarten. Even if she was like not having the greatest day, just she was so funny. Ashley had also done her mom and dad proud as a quiet overachiever. She was very smart. She didn't like to let anybody know that, but high school was a breeze for her. Why didn't she want anybody to know she was? Smart? She was very shy that way. She didn't like anybody to make a big deal out of her. Even with the world at her feet after finishing high school, Ashley happily took a job at an Arby's near the family home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, while deciding what career she would pursue. She really didn't know. Her options were open. And on the night she'd be killed, Ashley came home from work as usual and watched a Packers game with the family. She took her shower and then went to bed. The next thing Tammy remembers is suddenly being jolted from her sleep. I just specifically remember jumping out of my sleep like, <gasps> But she didn't know what had woken her. You know, and I'm looking at my alarm clock and it said 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. And now I'll think it back, I really believe that's when she died. So then I get up and I open the door up and in front of me standing this person with a gun, a big long gun. And what did you do? I'm like, oh my God, I thought we were being robbed. And Joe, were you still sleeping? She had called my name yeah. uh, and said, uh, check on Ashley, check on Ashley. In the upstairs bedroom. I'm like, Ashley, Ashley. I get up there and it's like, I couldn't really see that well. Joe was about to reel back in horror at the sight of his beloved teenage daughter lying dead in her bed after being brutally shot point blank in the face. And all of a sudden I just see her face was just gone. What did you do when you saw that? I just started screaming, who would do something like this? A distraught Tammy couldn't bring herself to look at her daughter's body. That would have made it real. To me, it wasn't real. Nobody in the house, including the love's two sons, heard the gunshot that killed Ashley. Fired by a masked intruder who'd broken into their house and then escaped through one of the doors and Tammy thinks he may have had an accomplice with him. I heard something, like a flash. I could see, like, somebody else running. But police can't say if there may have been a second intruder. So did you have DNA or fingerprints or anything that was left behind that night? We, we recovered evidence, and some of the evidence we, we can't disclose at this time, but there is and has been um, evidence to the crime lab and back. Milwaukee detectives had quickly discounted burglary as a motive after learning nothing was missing from the house. Is that a crime of, of passion or retaliation? How do you think you'd classify that? I think when you have a crime like this, you don't know for sure what their motive is until they explain it. It was 2 a.m. I mean, she was asleep, so we don't know what kind of interaction there was between her and the suspect or if the suspect just came up there and shot her. But they suspect Ashley had been specifically targeted. If it's random, that would be scary. Tammy had described the gunman to detectives as a Hispanic male about 20 years old, of average height and build. He had short, black spiked hair, wearing a dark zipper sweater or jacket. And police scoured Ashley's social media accounts looking for anyone who may have matched that description. They were all thoroughly reviewed and nothing led us to a suspect. None of Ashley's friends appeared to be a suspect either. We have talked to everybody that we were aware of that she socialized with, interviewed them, you know, we obtained their background information. But detectives would get reports that Ashley had been secretly meeting with a mystery man on several occasions before her killing. And it appeared to the people that saw those two interact that, that she didn't want 
other people to know she was meeting with this person, kind of like a, a secret friend or a, a, you know, an acquaintance of some sort. And they would hold a joint press conference with Ashley's family in an effort to find the so-called mystery man. Right now, we just need to talk to him to find out what he can tell us about his involvement with Ashley. Ashley's anguished parents plead with him to come forward. We feel like we are in hell and we can't climb out. Please, we beg of you, come forward. Anything, just any information, that you, even if you think it doesn't matter, just tell the police, please. But lifelong friend Joey Clancy is surprised Ashley didn't confide in her if she had a secret boyfriend. They talk about people with double lives and stuff, but Ashley was like way too honest to have a double life. There were also reports Ashley had been seen getting into a blue pickup truck with an unidentified man in the months before her murder. But investigators couldn't confirm them. We were unable to identify that particular truck or someone that would admit to being that person that picked her up. And they're still no closer to finding Ashley's killer than when they found her shot to death seven years ago. And that's what's hard and frustrating for us. But Ashley's mom refuses to give up hope, visiting her daughter's grave every day and vowing to keep visiting it until her murderer is brought to justice. You're never supposed to bury your children. Exactly. She just started her life. Usually I go every, every day to the cemetery. I know she's not there. I go there for me. I could talk to her and I feel, feel her. That's what I do it for. Coming up, with the opioid epidemic sweeping America, allegations fly that some greedy doctors are cashing in on the crisis. Crime Watch Daily goes inside the investigation. This is extremely dangerous, and people have died. People's lives have been ruined. That's next. How many times have you heard it? Opiates, an epidemic killing people all across the country. Where are they coming from? In some cases, believe it or not, greedy doctors trying to cash in. Sarah Fuller was about to be married. Instead, at just 32 years old, she was being buried. Dead from an overdose of powerful pain medication called fentanyl. Her death is now part of a growing concern of the drug and how it's being prescribed. This man, billionaire Dr. John Kapoor, is at the center of a full-blown investigation. His Arizona pharmaceutical company, Insys, manufactures Subsys, a spray pain medication with fentanyl. He's accused of lining his pockets by selling his drugs to patients who don't need them. There's no evidence against him. He didn't do anything wrong. Despite his lawyer's denial, seven of his top INSYS executives have been indicted, including INSYS founder Dr. John Kapoor, accused of racketeering, mail fraud, wire fraud, and conspiracy, charges Kapoor is denying. Do you think there are some doctors that may have led to this problem? I'm sure there are. Dr. Nikesh Seth is also in legal hot water, named in a lawsuit alleging drug company Insys and several doctors engaged in a nationwide racket involving an opioid so easy to take, you just spray it under your tongue. How long have you been in this office? So we've been in here about six months. Investigative reporter Dave Biscobing for our Phoenix affiliate ABC 15 grills Dr. Seth about his ties to Insys, the company that produces substance. You were tied with them. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? You know, so for the company itself, you know, I can't really speak for the company. I'm not too sure about that. And, and being tied to it, you know, there are legal things going on that I'm unable to speak for. The active ingredient in substance is fentanyl, an opioid so powerful it's sometimes compared to heroin. The FDA has approved subsis for cancer patients only. Here's the problem. The lawsuit alleges INSYS changed patient records to indicate they had cancer when in fact they did not, then charge insurance companies for pricey subsis prescriptions. The lawsuit also alleges INSYS bribed doctors with what it calls sham speaker fees in exchange for writing subsis prescriptions. Named in the suit, three Arizona doctors, and yes, one of them is Dr. Nikesh Seth. So that's not something you really want to talk about? No. Okay, because you were the number two doctor, according to the Attorney General's office. So, yeah. I mean, you wrote a lot of prescriptions, got a lot of money from them, so. Yeah, so we wrote, we wrote a lot about it. Uh, we wrote a lot of scripts, but it was a good product. And the suit alleges all those scripts made Insys a lot of money. 
We're talking millions, tens of millions? We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Whistleblower Patty Nixon worked for Insys and testified for the FBI, claiming she falsified patient records and billed insurance companies for payment. Most of the prescriptions and the charts that came over were for your regular chronic pain, knee pain, back pain, um, menstrual cramps. Not cancer. Not cancer. Was it unethical? Yes. Was it criminal? Absolutely. Authorities say this is the call that came in for Sarah Fuller, allegedly between an incest employee and an insurance company rep, obtained by the office of Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill. Hi, my name is and I'm with the doctor's office. But this caller is not from the doctor's office. She's allegedly a rep from the INSYS office. And what is the diagnosis for the patient? Medications intended for the management of breakthrough cancer pain. But authorities claim Sarah Fuller never had cancer. She was suffering neck and back pain. Despite that, the McCaskill investigation shows Fuller did get a substance prescription, only to die 15 months later, allegedly from an overdose of fentanyl. There were some insurance companies that started to catch on. They would put us on hold and they'd be like, hold on for just a second, because uh, they were suspicious. And then they would turn around and they would call the actual doctor's office themselves. And they would come back on the line with me and they would be like, I just called the doctor's office and they say there's no Patty that works there. Well, eek. But Patty tells Bisco Bing those gotcha moments didn't stand in their way. These insurance companies have hundreds and hundreds of phone reps right. that are answering these phone calls. So we'd just hang up and call back and see if we could get an, e an easier one. And Nixon says Inces had a name for the doctors who played ball. Oh uh, yeah, the whales. One of those whales, the lawsuit claims, is Dr. Nikesh Seth. We have employees inside Inces who have spoken to us on the record who say that they falsified charts for your patients. For my patients? Yes. Yeah, so unfortunately if they did that, that's obviously a, a problem with the company. The Arizona Attorney General says it's Dr. Seth's problem, too. Its lawsuit alleges prior to receiving those sham speaking fees, the pain doc wrote 11 substance prescriptions over two years. But when Insys started writing him checks, the lawsuit alleges Dr. Seth wrote 820 substance prescriptions, approximately 23 per month. Dr. Seth tells Biscobing the speaker fees are standard operating procedure. That's common in the industry. It's, it's unfortunate that it happened to be with a company that's under major scrutiny. Dr. Seth's lawyers have responded to the lawsuit, saying Seth lacked knowledge of incest's schemes. And Dr. Seth tells Biscobing he only had his patients' best interests in mind. I see thousands of patients. Only 1% of my patients have ended up on this product. So you stand by how you treated those patients? I do, yeah. Crime Watch Daily reached out to Insys for a response to the allegations and has not received comment. Insys did post a press release on its website, stating in part, the allegations contained in the Arizona Attorney General's complaint relate to former employees and physicians that are no longer associated with our company. It goes on to say we continue to cooperate with the investigation. Incest whistleblower Patty Nixon says that's a good thing. I can't let this slide anymore. This is extremely dangerous and people have died, people's lives have been ruined, and this company did it for profit. Right now, let me bring in ABC 15 reporter Dave Biscobing. Dave, were you surprised that Dr. Seth's PR team would be so actively offering interviews knowing he was named in a pretty big civil lawsuit? Well, it certainly surprised us, but we were more than willing to take them up on the offer. Dave, what is the Arizona Attorney General hoping to do with that civil lawsuit? I think it's two things. One, to hold INSYS and their key doctors accountable. And the second is to send a message to other companies and their doctors for the future. I know it's not illegal, but it sure seems unethical for these doctors to receive speaking fees for endorsing specific drugs, but it's, it's pretty commonplace, isn't it? Yes, it is. There are actually now several websites where you can go and look up your doctor and see if they're on the list. You've talked to the AG's office. Do you think this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this sort of alleged prescription fraud? Well, we do know there's a lot of money out there between drug companies and doctors. And when it comes to INSYS, there have actually been several doctors across the country who have been criminally charged for their role with this company. So I imagine we could see even more. ABC 15 reporter Dave Biscobing, thanks so much. And we'll, of course, follow this case as it goes through the courts.
criminals. We have a deep seven magnum, heroin, amphetamine. Drug dealers. This is why heroin is such an epidemic. And scammers. You claimed you had cancer. Crime Watch Daily is on the case. Do you have anything to say to your victims? Remember, we are watching.